Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we do Greek philosophy. So, we're not going to do all of Greek philosophy. We're going to talk about the big three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. A hundred years of philosophical development. So, first we have to talk about what philosophy is and how it's different from today. Philosophy today is ethics. How does one behave? That's not exactly how it worked in the ancient world. In the ancient world, it did that. How does one behave? But what it really did was science. Science, since 1500, basically, has replaced philosophy as the way of explaining how the world works. Like St. Thomas Aquinas is a philosopher, but he's really a scientist in the 1200s. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, they're all philosophers, yes, but they really worked as scientists. They were trying to explain how the world worked and how do people work within the world. And what they did was logic proofs, which was very mathematical. Uh, You did this in high school, like if P then Q, right? If P is greater than Q, then R. You know, this is how computers work. Programming, if this, then this. If you click on this button, these three reactions will happen. So, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle and early philosophers were trying to understand how the world worked, but they didn't have the math to do experiments the way modern science works. And they didn't have the journals and they didn't have the publishers and they didn't have the internet. They didn't have the way of connecting with other scientists to do a scientific method, to do all of these proofs. And so what they used was logic. They went, well, if this is the way things are, then this is the result. And they're trying to explain how people work. So let's start with Socrates. We're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about where does knowledge come from? How do you get knowledge? How do you know what you know? What are these guys kind of famous for? And then how did they feel about democracy? So we start with Socrates. Socrates is not how he's portrayed in the play, The Clouds. He's not this guy walking around with his head in the clouds, thinking big thoughts like, what color would I be if I could be a color? No. Socrates was a, was a soldier. He was a Democrat during the Peloponnesian War. He fought at the Battle of Delium in 415 BC, where the the Athenian army got crushed ultimately by the Thebans, and Socrates was almost killed. He fought for the democracy. So that's going to affect how he perceives people, knowledge, education, potential. So where does his knowledge come from? His answer is it's innate. It's in you. Remember, he's a Democrat. And democracy is about equality. You cannot have democracy without equality. You have to believe everybody has the same rights. Everybody has the same say in a democracy. And so if you believe that, you have to believe people are the same. 
They are equal. Well, when it comes to knowledge, where does knowledge come from? Well, he says it's inside of you in an equal amount. Everyone has the same knowledge inside of them. They all have the same potential. Makes total sense. If you believe in equality because you believe in democracy, you believe everyone has the same potential. So then it raises the question, why are there dumb people? If everyone has all the knowledge they need inside of them, and for Socrates, that's the, I think it's eight great questions, right? What is courage? What is honor? What is truth? And before you're like, oh, those are dumb. Think about it. What is truth? Oh, you're like, oh, well, you're, you tell the truth. It's honesty. Yeah. If you're an American and you have kids, tell me about the big guy in the red suit who shows up in December. Hmm? Hmm? Have you been telling your kids a big guy with a fluffy beard shows up and leaves stuff underneath Christmas trees? Did you even go to the mall for proof? Look, kids, there's Santa. Let me ask you a question. How long have you been lying to your kids about what really happens in December? That's a lie. Not only have you been lying, everyone in your family has been lying. In fact, every adult your kids ever knew lied to them their entire life up until the moment they had an anorisis, the moment of realization that the big guy in the red suit... Exactly. 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 And for those of you who were watching this and your kids were watching this, well, there you go. Sorry. But that's the idea. Is Socrates is like, dude, man, are you a liar? Are you a liar? And you're going to say, no, I'm not a liar because liars are bad people. I'm doing the lie. I am telling a lie. But the lie, the December lie that America tells is for fun. It's a good lie. Well, that's what Socrates' problem is. He's like, dude, that's how we have to question that. Because if liars are bad... And you're a liar, but you're good, then what is the truth? What is lying? What is honesty? And so these things get very complicated. Is the man who runs into a burning building to save someone else courageous? And you go, of course he is. Well, is he? What if his wife has left him and his kids hate him and he just lost his job and he's got no money and he's been thinking about suicide anyway? The question is, are you courageous if you have nothing to lose? And that's the question Socrates asks. Is, that, is it courage if you have nothing to lose? Or does it require the possibility of losing something for you to have courage. I don't know. It's a good question. Because running into a burning building is, by its very nature, courageous. But here's our question of deed versus motivation. But is his motivation a courageous motivation? Maybe not, because he's okay if the house falls down upon him. Then, 
instead of being the loser whose wife kicked him out and his kids don't want to talk to him, he's a hero. See, he gets something in the end if he dies. Instead of losing something in the end. Do you see how... And I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying what sounds like, dude, Socrates, man, these are, these are easy questions. Actually, aren't that easy. And so he believes all knowledge is innate. It's all inside of you. But you have dumb people. You clearly have dumb people. We, we all deal with dumb people all the time. Why? Why are there dumb people if everyone has knowledge inside of them? All the knowledge inside of them. And the answer is, you don't have access to it. You don't know what you don't know. And so, it has to be pulled out of you. By someone who's smarter than you. By a mentor. And that's the leading questions. That's the Socratic method. That's what I use in class. Like, you will notice, I never ask a question. You cannot answer. You may think you can't answer them, but if you take a minute and you ever put on your thinking cap and you go, hmm, you can answer my questions because they build upon each other. Now, maybe you go in the wrong path and then it's my job to bring you back, but that's just the wrong path. It's not wrong thinking. It just turned out to be the wrong path at that particular time. At other times, it may be the right path. But that's leading questions. I know where I want you to end up. I want you to get to that point. And so the question, the, the response I don't like in my classes is, I don't know. Because I know you do know. You just don't know that you do, that you do know. And you have no confidence in yourself. Because if you answer my questions step by step by step by step, you will end at the answer. And you go, oh, I do love him. And you see this in romantic comedies all the time, right? St you know, oh, he drives me crazy. Plus, I like to be around him. Plus, he was nice to my mother. Plus, uh, he's good to my dog. Plus... Oh my God, I love him. This is the, the, the Hallmark Christmas movies, right? And at the start, they're not like, oh, we will be in love. No, it takes a series of buildings, of experiences, the romantic comedy experiences, that by the end, you're like, oh, I do love you. I didn't even know I did, but I do. That's Socratic. The leading questions, that one, that you get to five, not by going... Um, five times one or ten divided by two that you go one plus one plus one plus one because that one is not scary you've seen the number one you know the number one and it's plus it ain't hard you know plus you have one and then you take your your one finger on your right hand and you go one and then you put the right hand and the left hand together and you got two and you're like oh that ain't hard and so it's one plus one plus one plus one gets you to the answer. Now, what is Socrates most famous for? Dying. David's painting of the death of Socrates, which is now displayed on the video, is um, one of the great paintings. Go to the Louvre and see it. Um, Remember, Socrates is like 72 years old, so you could take a look at his abs and then, you know, take a look at yourself in the mirror, guys. Socrates had this rock and bod at 72. Um, all the men are crying. Oh, and it's his last lecture. I am teaching you the last. His, his fingers up in the air. He is teaching. Why is his death? Why does his death matter? Because he will be judiciously murdered by the democracy because he was teaching and his students went home and they said, mama, dad, guess what Socrates taught me? And the parents were like, oh, I don't like that stuff. And they put him on trial. The, the city put Athens, put Socrates on trial as a traitor to the values of the state. 
And so he had a trial of which they used, if you read Plato's apology, apologia, apology, which does not mean apology in Greek means explanation. It does mean, not mean to say, I'm sorry, which is one of those confusing things because Christians will make it, I'm sorry. Why? Because you're a bad person and you're always guilty before God. So apology is an explanation for the bad stuff you've done in Christianity. In Greek, it's just an explanation. It has no, no, no moral value to it. Whereas in Christianity, everything has a moral value because you're a terrible person because God is awesome. Remember, you're a sinner. So everything you do is bad. Even the good stuff you did is still kind of bad. So apology becomes the I'm sorry for being a bad person. Well, of course you're sorry for being a bad person. You're a bad person in Christianity, right? Your soul is good, but you, you're bad. So, and don't at me about that. Yes, I know Protestantism, different kind of Protestantisms are different on this thing, but we're not talking about that because the word goes back to the ancient Greek and we're talking like early Christianity in the three, four hundreds, you know, AD. So don't at me. But if you read Plato's Apologia, Apology, it's, it's, they spend half the trial saying, I am not the guy in the plays, in the clouds, and, and, is it the frogs? I think it's the frogs. It's, I'm not that guy. I'm not that, and the, and the, and the prosecution's like, you know, your name's, the character's name Socrates. Your name is Socrates. I think he's the same person. And you're like, no, it's a play. Anyway, there's a trial, there's a jury, and the jury is supposed to be like 500 people, like everybody wanted on this jury. And what did the jury find? Socrates, guilty. And so what Socrates chose was rather than be executed, which would have been humiliating, was to commit suicide, which was much more honorable. And so in our painting by David in 1800 or so, during the French Revolution, you see Socrates giving his last lecture to his students who are emotionally fraught. He's asking, now he is not sad at all. He's, give me the cup, give me. And there's the young man giving him the cup. Now, now there's cool analysis is here that can be can be taken um and we'll do that in a second but he's give me the cup i will take the poison i will take the poison give me the cup and so they're handing the cup and he's like socrates is not afraid of this he is not he's the only one who's not emotional <sighs> So why is this important? It's because of the way Plato, that dude, if you're watching the video, the dude on the left, the gray old haired dude, the, the dude sitting, not looking at Socrates with his, with his facing away, sitting who's facing away. That's supposed to be Plato. The way he's going to write about this moment, because Socrates leaves nothing. Socrates doesn't write anything down. Everything we know about Socrates is as a character in Plato's books. Now, there's a cool analysis. I saw it somewhere. I think it's Nerd Writer um, on YouTube um, where an analysis comes that this is all memory. So you see Plato as an old man. Now, he would have been a young man at this time. So he might be the man in the red handing the cup. Uh, that might also be Xenophon, another philosopher, warrior, soldier, uh, he's going to write the Anabasis. He's going to write a history of, is it the Peloponnesian War? Um, Xenophon is going to be one of the other greats. He's kind of, he's in some ways, he's unsung. He's kind of the forgotten kind of great Greek poet warrior kind of guy. Um, because he's just for, he's just not in the textbooks. And But the moment you get into classical studies, there's Xenophon. And you're like, oh, Xenophon. So... Um, but be that as it may, 
the idea is that it's Plato as an old man remembering the death of Socrates, his, his mentor, his best friend, his mentor, the man he admired. And so he's not looking at it. He's not engaging in it. He's got the scroll at the bottom with the ink, with the, with the, with the quill, with the pen, so that he's writing, you know, he's writing the death of Socrates, writing the apology. That's supposed to be what that is at the bottom at his feet. And he's sitting there having, you know, re he's remembering this moment and he's too overcome with emotion and sadness to be able to write it down at that moment. So he had to put all his accoutrements down so that he could just be in the catharsis, the pathos and the catharsis of the moment. Plato is the reason this matters because Plato will represent this moment the death of Socrates as truth being murdered by ignorance. That Socrates' suicide is truth standing up against ignorance. That the people are dumb. And in their infinite wisdom of dumbness, they chose to murder the smartest man who ever lived, according to Plato. And so you can already see how Plato's going to feel about democracy and people. But that's how it's going to be portrayed. Of truth, of, 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 of politics, of idiocy, trying to wipe out the truth. It's the theme of 1984. It's the theme of Animal Farm. It's the theme of a whole lot of work in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. The post-fascism books you know a whole lot of work of the last 10 years of people putting out you know fake news and and you know can you believe what you see on the internet things of that nature and so plato represents the death of socrates as truth standing up to ignorance of not giving in So how does Socrates feel about democracy? He likes democracy. He accepts the judgment of the jury. He doesn't flee. He doesn't leave Athens. He doesn't go into exile. He could have. He had friends. His students would have smuggled him out. But no. The jury found him guilty. He accepts the democracy's judgment. He stands up to it, but he accepts it. He believes all people are equal and that you just need, people just needed help. They all have the same potential. So he believes in democracy. He fought for it in the Peloponnesian War. Plato, on the other hand, saw what democracy did to his friend. And so Plato is very, he's not the opposite of Socrates because he believes most of what Socrates says. But when he comes to people, he just can't, can't agree with it. And so if Socrates says knowledge is inside of you intimately, right there, right next to your, right next to your spleen, that's where knowledge is. Plato says knowledge is in the ether. It is nowhere close to you. It is on a whole nother plane of the universe. It is so far away from you, you can never touch it, taste it, experience it. You cannot ever engage in true knowledge. It is so far away from you. Now, you should already start to be going, hey, wait a minute. I've heard this before. I know of a place so far away you can never experience in your lifetime. Hmm. Well, so what does Plato say about how do you learn? Well, how do you learn? Someone smarter than you tells you. 
This is elementary school. Think about it. This is shapes, right? Draw a circle. Go ahead. Just draw a circle. Draw a circle. I'm telling you in a little spot in your notes, draw a circle. How do you know you're right? How do you know that's a circle? And how do you know it's a pretty crappy circle? Because it is. You did not draw a perfect circle where all dots along that line are equidistant from all other dots. In fact, if you were smart enough to go get a compass, you still don't draw a perfect circle. And you're like, well, it looks pretty good to me. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks better than one hand drawn. But that's just a comparison. It's not perfect. Why? Because the paper is made by people who are not perfect. The compass is made by people who are not perfect. The pencil is made by people who are not perfect. You are not perfect. So what you're drawing is something closer to perfection. And you look at it and you go, ah, oh, that's pretty good. Well, how do you know it's pretty good? Because you have in your mind what a circle is supposed to look like. Well, where did that image come from? And here's the, here's the other part. Why didn't you draw three lines? One line going top to bottom on the left, one line going top to bottom on the right, and one line across on the bottom. And you're going to say, oh, professor, that's a triangle. How do you know? Who told you? You did not get born and go, I know what a triangle looks like. You did not go to first grade going, I know what a triangle looks like. How do you know what a circle is supposed to look like? How do you know what a triangle is supposed to look like? And Plato says, it's because someone smarter than you told you. Because if you went to first grade and they said, draw a circle and you drew a triangle, they marked you wrong and embarrassed you and said, you're wrong, you're dumb. Dummy, dumb, dumb, dumb. And the next time I ask you to draw a circle, what are you going to draw? You're like that round thingy. And you're like, yep, yeah, uh-huh. Otherwise, you'll get it wrong again. Someone smarter, teacher, a parent, told you what it's supposed to be. Well, how do they know? Well, someone smarter told them. How do they know? Someone smarter told them. How do they know? Someone smarter told them. Well, if you take this to its logical conclusion, there must have been a person who discovered what a circle is supposed to look like. How did they know? For Plato, that circle must exist. A perfect circle must exist. The circle all circles want to be must exist. So who can know that? Someone really smart who's jacked into the universe. Like Neo in the Matrix. You plug him in and boom, he can download from the universe, what a triangle is supposed to look like. What a right triangle, what an isosceles triangle, what these triangles are supposed to look like, what a circle is supposed to look like. And then we'll tell people, that's not a circle, that's not a circle. That's, oh, that's doing okay, but it's still not a circle. But where did their image of that circle come from? For Plato, it must exist somewhere, and that's the ether. And so the perfect circle exists in the ether. And back at the back in the day, some smart dude or dudess was jacked into the universe, had the revelation of what a circle looks like, and then started telling people what a circle and a triangle looks like. And through time of smart people telling dumb people what these things look like, people learned. Someone smarter than you tells you what you need to know. So then what is he famous for? This concept of perfection. This concept that out there is perfect knowledge. That there is a place of perfect knowledge. And if you are a uh, Christian or Muslim or even Jewish, you know what that place is. That's the Christian Catholic concept of heaven. That's St. Augustine. St. Augustine will be a philosopher 
a Roman philosopher in the 400s while Rome is collapsing, 400s AD. And people will come to him because he's a smart guy, he's a religious leader, and he's like, oh, Augustine, 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 just before he was a saint, but Augustine, Rome is collapsing, what do we do? And he says, do not worry. Heaven is the goal. Do not worry about the fall of Rome. Heaven is the key. Worry about getting to heaven. And they're like, well, wait a minute there, uh, buddy boy. Uh, I've read my Gospels, and heaven sounds like a cool place, but it sounds like I just hang out with Jesus. Uh, there's no description here about what happens once I get there. There's no pearly gates. There's no Peter with a mug out front with a giant doomsday book. There, there's no description. It just is like the gates of heaven will open and that's going to be cool. And I'm sure it's cool, but is it just me and Jesus hanging out playing chess for like ever? Like, what's it like? And Augustine looks at these Romans and says, well, did you read your Plato? And they say, of course, Augustine, we're Romans. Of course we read our Plato. We ro conquered Rome a thousand 400, 600 years ago, right? We took all their knowledge. Of course, I have been to school. We learned the Greeks. Yes, of course I have read Plato. And he's like, well, remember how he says there's the ether where there's the perfect um, form of everything? And they're like, yeah, what does this have to do with Jesus? Jesus wasn't Greek. And he's like, Augustine pulls out a little bit of his hair and goes, okay, yes, Jesus wasn't Greek, but that place where everything is perfect that's heaven. Now, for Augustine, it's a perfect Rome. Augustine was a Roman, so he thought of heaven as a city, as a perfect Rome, led by the perfect emperor, God. This is where God's perfection comes from, is Augustine. So heaven is perfect and everything in it is perfect. And if I asked you to write your idea of heaven, none of you, you would all have different versions. I would bet though, many of you would have the suburban, suburban version of heaven. Parks, rivers, wide streets and boulevards, not a lot of traffic. Like, like Haddonfield on a Friday afternoon. You'd be like, that's heaven. You go and play golf in the morning. It's always 65 degrees outside. You know, it's never too hot. You know, it's cool enough that you could wear a sweater, but you don't have to. So, because you live in the suburbs, and so you would have a suburban version. Well, a Roman thinks about Rome. But the idea is that it's perfect. There's the perfect circle, that God is perfect. He's a perfect human, but he's not human, but that's a whole nother problem. We talked about that when we did monotheism, but he's the perfect version of humanity. That everything there is perfect. And your version of heaven is everything's good. Like there's no dog poop in heaven. There might be dogs, but no dog poop, right? You might have a lot of kittens, but no cats in your heaven. So... It's perfection. That's St. Augustine. But that's St. Augustine Christianizing Plato. So what does he think about democracy? He thinks democracy is a terrible idea. He writes a book called The Republic, which is not the Roman Republic. This is a fantasy book. But he writes a book called The Republic, where he just destroys democracy. This is not a handbook for government, by the way. But he says, you know who should run government? The smartest people. The strongest people, and he is totally cool with gender. Smartest people are men or women. The strongest are men or women. So the strongest people defend the, defend the republic. The smartest people run it, and everyone else works because they're dumb. Right? This is the movie Idi Idiocra Id Idiocracy with uh, Luke Wilson, where they're like, Luke Wilson is the smartest man alive. He will run our society. That's Plato. Plato looked at everyone and said, you're all idiots. Now, Plato was a smart guy, and so he said, I should run the society, and people like me should run the society. You people suck. You people had Socrates, and what did you do with him? Murdered him. So you're dumb. So Plato's attitude towards people 
is that they're dumb and democracy is a terrible form of government. What about Aristotle? Well, if knowledge, if Socrates has knowledge inside of you and Plato has Socrates so far away from you, you can't experience it. Aristotle, who hated Plato, Aristotle is simultaneously Plato's best student and the two are famously like rivals. Aristotle is a student of Plato. He's younger than Plato. He's the next generation. And he just thinks Plato is wrong. He thinks he's just wrong. So he's the he's the balance between the Socrates and the Plato. So if Socrates has knowledge inside of you and Plato has it so far away from you you can never experience it, Aristotle has it in nature. It's out there. It's there. It's everywhere. It's all around you. You can experience knowledge. You can find it. It's all around you. It's in the world around you. You want to know what a good joke sounds like? Go to comedy stores. Go to go to go to stand up comedy and listen. And you'll learn the difference between a good joke and a bad joke. You want to know um, how to be a successful couple? Observe. Go and watch good couples be together and you will learn. So observation, experience, go and do it. And so Aristotle becomes famous for his, basically his ingredients, politics and the poetics, the two big books where he talks about, there is no perfect form. He disagrees with Plato immediately. He says, but good government has X, Y, and Z. Good plays have X, Y, and Z. They have ingredients. Good romances, good good relationships have X, Y, and Z. Like they have ingredients. And you can see this and you can experience this, not experiment. You have to find, you want to know how a river works? Go and watch a river. Go and look at it. Go be thorough. And Walden, go and experience the solitude of nature and you will find God, as they say. He, it's of the three of them, it is Aristotle who is the big winner. He is the source of medieval knowledge. If he said it, it was true. He is considered the smartest man who ever lived by the time of the Middle Ages. Plato is, is, people like Plato, especially the richer and smarter you are, the more you like Plato. So you, 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 every kind of couple hundred years, you get neo-Platonists, neo people who like Plato again, because they're like, oh, I'm smart. And Plato is smart. And a lot of people are dumb. Ooh, I like this philosophy. Whereas Aristotle by the middle ages is considered the most robust, the he settled all bar bets. If if he said it, it's like it's like Einstein. You get you whip out a quote from Einstein. People go, oh well, I guess it's true. He's that. He's Newton for that generation. If he says it, it was considered true. It was considered right because Aristotle said it. So he becomes the basis for medieval knowledge. Science, early science, Galileo and Hooke and all those early scientists, right? They're arguing not with the Catholic Church. They're arguing with Aristotle. That's their problem. The Catholic Church is is in the 1500s under pressure, under problems, right? But the Catholic Church still could describe God better than anybody else. It had been doing it for a thousand years, 1500 years, excuse me. Right. But the Catholic Church also relied on Aristotle to describe how the world worked. And Galileo saying, maybe Aristotle's wrong. You know, the moons of Jupiter go around Jupiter. They don't go around the Earth. Maybe the Earth isn't the center of the universe. Well, the problem with that is everyone considered Aristotle to be right. Imagine you woke up and in your Twitter feed was everything you know is wrong. You'd freak out too. You'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who does this person think he is? 
And the Catholic Church has the problem of if you start if you start questioning Aristotle, what's to stop you from questioning the church, which is in the middle of the Reformation where people are questioning the church. So part of the part of the church's argument was we we're right and you know we're right because Aristotle's right. And we're based on Aristotle and see if Aristotle's right, then we are right. And that's a hard argument to go against. You're like, well, you know, that's true. I guess Aristotle is right. And here comes Galileo being like, you know what? Aristotle might be wrong. Which just freaks everybody out because now all knowledge is open. Everything gets to be questioned. White is black. Black is white. Up is down. The back is the front. Your shirt should be worn as pants. Your pants should be worn as a hat. You who knows everything is now up for grabs. And so the crisis science has to become science. For science to be right, it has to be right 100% of the time. Why? We don't ask 100% accuracy of anything else. Why science? And the answer is cuz it had to argue against Aristotle, the smartest man who ever lived. So it had to be right. Otherwise, people wouldn't have believed it. So what does Aristotle think about democracy? Well, since much of his stuff is between Socrates and Plato, same here. All people have potential. Remember, why are there dumb people? Well, if you could go and observe nature, you could go out and watch the river work. Why are people dumb? Because they don't go out, because they don't experience because they don't observe. They choose not to. They choose ignorance. They don't choose knowledge. For Plato, people are ignorant. And they stay there until someone smarter comes along and says, I will make you smart whether you like it or not. To Socrates, all people have potential. They just need help. The people want to be smart. They're ignorant until someone can help pull it out of them. But they all have potential. So for Aristotle, everyone has potential because you can go out and learn. But people choose not to. So democracy is an okay form of government. It's not perfect. It's not great. But it's not bad either. Democracy can work. But it's relying on people to do the work of knowledge. As Ben Franklin will say, as the founding fathers will say, you know, with the founding of newspapers and such, right? Democracy relies upon an educated populace, right? An informed people, right? That's Aristotle. That's not Plato. And that's not Socrates. That's Aristotle. And so democracy can work, but it's not a great form of government because people fail, because people are people. So, that is the end of our Greeks chapter. Congratulations, you made it. Woo! We've done the Persian Wars, the Peloponnesian Wars. We've done drama. We've done philosophy. I mean, we have done some of the biggest things you can do in this class. So congratulations. Next we do the Romans. And we conquer the world. Then we lose the world. Then we reconquer the world. And then we lose it again. So good luck. See you soon. Be careful out there. Bye.